Welcome to the HU Movemakers Podcast, where we highlight folks that are blazing the trail and making moves in Howard culture. Hello and welcome to the HU Movemaker Podcast, where we highlight folks in Howard culture that are making moves. Today, we got a very special guest in the building, owner, operator, Chick-fil-A in South Plainfield, Jersey, leading 110 team member that's 110 headaches if you ask me <laughs> ibm luke oil silicon valley exxon mobile man sales operations howard university man school to be nba from Rutgers, happily married national honor society you know, from both universities that's clutch this brother loves to travel loves to read Love to play sports, Alpha Phi Alpha Beta Chapter. Lived in the infamous house on Second Street. <laughs> a lot of folks say he was a grown man when he was at Howard, man. But uh, today I want to welcome William Bridges to the show, man. Will, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for coming on. Oh, man, Josh, thank you so much for the privilege to come on. It's an honor to be able to speak with you and uh, can't wait to talk with you about some of my journeys and um, really highlight the Howard experience, man. I appreciate it. For sure, man. So uh, you went from oil to, let's see, like tech. Yeah, yeah. Right. Now you in the kitchen. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> now you in the kitchen, man, that Chick-fil-A, which is like, uh, Chick-fil-A has like a cult following. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? People love Chick-fil-A. Like in Chicago, we love Harold's, but we right. love Chick. we love Chick-fil-A too. And and I remember you telling me like one in every sixty thousand people that apply, yeah, yeah, to Chick Fil A, uh, to to be an operator, yeah, like those are the odds. Like how? I mean, given your background, I don't see like uh, chef. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. tell me how that happened. Absolutely, man. How That's were you chosen? Yeah, um, you know, like you said, you know, being with Chick Fil A to me has been an honor. It's been a a, a long journey. And because the business is so successful and there's a, a cult following, like you mentioned, uh, the barriers to entry can, can be very challenging. You know, as of right now, uh, the restaurant gets about 60,000 applications for ownership per year and they select maybe 100, 150 people. So obviously that's well less than, than 1%. So wow. um, to be able to be selected is indeed an honor. And um, I feel, even though I, I come from different backgrounds um, mm -hmm. in, in tech and oil, uh, the preparation that I've had in those roles, you know, being able to work directly with clients and customers and various leadership and sales and customer service roles, really provided that foundation to be able to feel confident in applying for Chick-fil-A and um and making that transition so uh even though it's a different industry and so forth uh a lot of those principles still apply as far as sound effective leadership working with others um, being able to get the most out of others uh, having a strong uh, connection to the community and wanting to give back and really driving you know solid you know business results so uh, although it's different it's a little bit it's still some of the same and as far as connecting directly with Chick-fil-A, it really goes back to when I was young, man. You know, uh, my grandmother had a nonprofit where we used to serve Thanksgiving Day meals to senior citizens in Washington, D.C. And I did that for about 10 years volunteering. And I saw firsthand how great it was to unite people around a great meal. And it really stuck with me, that feeling, you know. And I told myself that if I had an opportunity to kind of relive that, then I would pursue it. Now, you know, fast forward, you know, some some great experience in business and in various universities. Um, I was able to, you know, find that great partnership with Chick-fil-A and kind of merge both of those passions as far as working with others, giving back, uh, uniting people around a great meal along with business. So um, that's the journey that I kind of took. It's kind of a merger of my past, you know, with my future to kind of or my present to kind of build out my future. So. That's how it kind of came about. Welcome to the Go Fish Village podcast. As a Chinese proverb says, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. At Go Fish, our goal is to teach individuals just like you how to build wealth through real estate. So what, what, I mean, what, uh, 
what what made you apply for this opportunity? Because it doesn't seem like that was on your career trajectory. How did yeah. this opportunity come about? Yeah, yeah. Well, being out there in Silicon Valley, you know, it's a very competitive nature, as you can imagine. You know, I was working out there at IBM and robotics and automation and just being around uh, a lot of people um, in the Valley who are very competitive um, and entrepreneurship based. Um, I always thought about, you know, how can I start my own venture? How can I move forward uh, in entrepreneurship? And I always looked at, you know, this journey as a, um, a continuous journey that actually started at Howard. You know, I worked with, uh, I never forget a meeting that I had with one of my advisors where uh, we had a conversation about what I wanted in my career. And I knew that I wanted to pursue entrepreneurship ultimately. And I knew that I wanted to work in corporate America as well. So when I was 19, we had that conversation and we broke down um, that trajectory into 30 years. You know, I wanted to be in position to retire by age 50. Mm. So I took that 30 years from then until 50, roughly 30 years. Why, why 50? Yeah, because 50 was uh, just an a, a aggressive target. And, you know, I had a couple family members who were fortunate enough to retire at that age. And I thought it would be a great goal to achieve. Now, whether I did it or not, I wanted to be completely up to me. But I had a goal of doing that. So uh, the first 15 years would be working in corporate America. And if I started my own entrepreneurial venture, then great. But if not, then I would pursue franchising in that second 15 year bucket. And I was fortunate enough to stay on that track. And now I'm kind of living the dreams of entrepreneurship through franchising. Yeah, no, that's that's a that's a that's a dope goal, man. Um, so tell me tell me about the process, man. I mean, one in sixty thousand. That sounds like a long shot, even for somebody yeah. that has had tremendous success. Yeah. You know, in whatever field, one in sixty thousand. I mean, that's uh, yeah. I, I yeah. think uh, you got a better chance at a lot of things. You know, yeah. It's funny that you say that because uh, you know, there's articles you know on the on the web talking about. You have an easier chance of getting accepted in the Harvard or Stanford than it is to be uh, selected as a Chick-fil-A franchisee. But, um, you know, you really step out there on faith. You know, um, fortunately for me, I've had a, a proven track record of success and not just uh, business and leadership through, you know, a lot of great companies, but also through my you know personal side of things, you know managing my finances, uh, you know, at, at, at a really good level, um, schooling, you know, through great universities like Howard and Rutgers and so forth, and uh, a track record of community service. So, you know, you add those things up and, you know, you go through the interview process, which can be pretty lengthy, and you just really focus in on, you know, the company, the culture, and apply some of those skills that you've already acquired to what could be if you were to be a franchisee and kind of let the chips fall where they may. You know, there's a ton of uh, highly qualified applicants, as you can imagine, who don't get an opportunity to make it. But um, I was one of those fortunate people um, based off of some of my personal uh, successes and my professional success. So very happy. What, um, I mean, when you when you initially apply, was it just like, hey, I'm gonna just fill out this application, or were you like, yo, this is this is a real goal of mine to open up yeah. a Chick Fil A? Yeah, yeah. No, it took a it took a lot of uh, planning beforehand. You know, my wife and I, she's business minded as well, and and she's been in corporate America for a while. Uh, we had to sit down and you know constantly revise our our short, medium, and, and long term goals to see what was next. And when we focused in on Chick-fil-A, we knew that we wanted to be with a, a company that had a strong presence, who had, you know, servant leadership as one of its core tenants, who had a great business model and um, also had a penchant for customer service and, and, and working in the community. So we did a lot of research on it and we attended information sessions and really dived into um, the background of the company, where the company was headed and what that franchise franchisee relationship model looked like. And then once we, you know, saw the, the positives from that, we decided to uh, collectively, you know, go for it. And she was very instrumental in helping me through the application process, helping me through the interview process. 
and really supportive of me throughout you know the whole process because it took about four years for me so it was um very challenging but wow, it was a four-year you know, process yeah yeah man did uh so is your wife is she in the restaurant too no 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 she's uh she's an executive with uh banana republic and gap so she has her own uh career in corporate retail and um is really the rock of our family and without her you know uh, her support it would have been very difficult to achieve uh this this opportunity to be a franchise with so was it is it a situation like uh like most small businesses or most entrepreneur ventures where you are not profitable at the gate or is it like more turnkey situation where you kind of cash flowing after you know well, after yeah. you open yeah i'll say that um you know chick-fil-a has a unique business model um in itself in this franchise system and you know just like with other businesses you know the amount of effort that you put in along with the brand that you're associated with along with your customer following and uh, your ability to really project your service or your product offering um, is really the determinant on you know how well you'll do financially uh, fortunately Chick-fil-A has a strong, strong brand, as you mentioned before. Um, but you know, you still have to execute. And as franchise as a franchisee, I don't take that for granted. You know, it's not a given that I have, you know, the popularity or the success that we have at our restaurant. So we have to make sure that we work continuously to uh, live up to those standards. And um, you know, if you do that, then you know, there should be rewards for anybody. Mm -hmm. So I know that uh, when you when you um, apply, you said they looked at your you know the the work you did in the community. Yeah, yeah. Um, they looked at um, your personal finances because they did that when I you know I'm an all state agent, so okay. I mean they dissected everything. You know, yeah. they're like who you owe money to, <laughs> like what type. You know, they you know they because because you're dealing with a lot of money, absolutely, and you're dealing with their brand, yeah, uh, as as well. And then they look at um your your leadership. Yeah. uh you know these are all you know core tenants and, and you said it, it kind of you know started when you were younger and i find that ironic man because so many people that come on the show it's always like a grandma it's yeah. always like a you know somebody that instilled certain things in them yeah when they were when they were young man um and you you have what one kid one kid yeah you got one how old four years old man four man so how is it like because you just opened like less than a year ago right yeah august 2020 we opened in the so, middle of the pandemic in the middle of the pandemic man so you talk about challenges up. josh <laughs> <laughs> so i mean i mean at least you got a drive through so people yeah. can come in through the drive through but uh what what was that like i mean that's got to be stressful on the family on the, uh your wife as an executive you an entrepreneur you know entrepreneur is just a sexy word for like a lot of work you know what i mean <laughs> and responsibility and yep. then, you know you got the you got your your uh child too so, and, and yeah. you know we want to pour into our children we want to give them everything and then there's that balance from am i working i don't want to work so that i miss out on marriage miss out on the balance miss out on you know having the complete experience man what are you doing to like make sure you stay balanced yeah, yeah, no, great questions. I'll start with uh, you know some of those challenges opening up in COVID and so forth. Yeah, um, you know, as you mentioned, in back in 2020, after COVID hit the scene, every day was worse than the preceding day. You know, so back in July when we were really starting to hire up for the restaurant, I had to hire 140 people, so it was nonstop. You know, that's uh, tough, man. To people have, don't know how hard it is to hire folks. And I mean, they don't. I mean, they don't want to work. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? And in the hire, but hire <laughs> good people. Yeah. You know, to be able to live up to that Chick Fil A culture, that Chick Fil A customer standard. Because how old are they? How old are the folks that you hire? Yeah, we have a, a good mixture of people, but um, you know, we have people as young as 16, and then it goes up to you know working professionals and so forth. So, wow. being able to one attract them, and then you know, uh, kind of see the potential in them to live up to that Chick Fil A model uh, has been very, very challenging, especially in the times where you know there's a lot of federal relief 
for COVID and rightfully so, where a lot of people obviously are hurting. Um, so it behooves some people not to really work right now. So you have a segment Tough. of the marketplace that's not even applying. So then there's a fight, especially for the food service realm for those team members who are willing to work and then, you know, interviewing them, getting them to come in and then training them up and getting them acclimated with the systems and the supply chain of Chick-fil-A uh, is just an ongoing challenge. And um, yeah, it, it, it will continue, but it's also the most rewarding. You know, I have a, a lot of young team members who are really, really great. I get to see them develop. I get to see them mature. Uh, Chick-fil-A has a wonderful scholarship foundation that um, some of my team members have received that obviously, you know, promotes college education and so forth. And I get to really train and develop some young uh, team members to uh, take on more responsibility, uh, develop applicable skills in leadership and customer service, working as a member of a team, uh, thinking in a fast paced environment and working for a prestigious brand and those skills that they can acquire here can be applicable to any walk of life that they choose afterwards. So although it's challenging uh, in this COVID you know, pandemic, uh, it's also very, very rewarding because I get to work with some remarkable, remarkable young people. So how many, how many hours a week are you working? Yeah, I actually started to take a little bit um, of time <laughs> and, and spend more time at home. But when we first started, I mean, man, I was working uh, typically from eight to eight to nine. So maybe, you know, 13, 13 hour days Man. and then come home and handle a lot of the back office and computer stuff and emails and my wife, wife was good with that. Your wife was good with that. She was, she was good with it initially, but it got played out real fast, <laughs> you know, because fortunately she was able to work from home, but she obviously has a very challenging, uh, career in her, in her own right. And, you know, uh, so the stress with that and then also taking care of our son through different points where, you know, kids weren't allowed in school was a huge, huge challenge. But now I am not putting in those 13, 14 hour work days. I'm, um, I'm, I've cut that down tremendously and have really been able to spend more time with the family, which is um, that great goal uh, of that work life balance, even in entrepreneurship that you spoke about. Because if you if we talk about 13 hour days, I mean, that's still 30 minutes to work yeah 30 yeah. minutes home yeah you know yeah. that's i guess that's like the time to like think about what you got to do absolutely and then but at the same time you know retail man you you seven days a week man and every day with 110 employees you got people calling off all the time yeah um yep. tell me about your process for building a team yeah yeah it's um it takes a lot you know um first we want to uh, one partner with third parties who have great visibility to would be applicants and oh, that okay. was the foundation of, of that. So our HR team works with various third parties in uh, soliciting great talent. And then it's a matter of getting them in. Um, so they basically send you some applicants, some interview, some interviewees uh, on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. We put out the job rec and okay. our, um, our HR team manages it through different third party websites to solicit uh, applicants. And then we hopefully bring in some uh, well-qualified <laughs> applicants and then go through a couple interviews uh, and so forth to see if they kind of have that chip. That's crazy. Running a business, man, you have a whole new respect for HR. Oh you my know. God, man. It is <laughs> absolutely brutal. It'll keep a lot of stress off your plate, yeah. right? Because at first I was like, man, what's you just hire somebody like everybody want to work? Then you, right, you, you right, start right. hiring people and you realize like this is a whole that's a whole department. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. And the dynamics of it, man, is I mean, I've done a lot of hiring for Exxon and IBM and so forth, but the dynamic in food service is so different because literally, literally, Josh, you have 110 team members on staff, but like I can go in any part of the restaurant and a team member, uh, I could have a 16 year old team member who's working just for some summer money or to put away for college or what have you. And then right next to that person working is a team member who's in their mid to late thirties, who's looking at this job as a means to an end to put food on the table. You know, mm -hmm. those are two very different, 
you know, team members at different points of their lives, uh, with different levels of responsibility. And how do you to, be able to give them what they need to be successful is a lot. How do you how do you keep the morale high in a situation like that? Because there's that stigma of if you 30 and you working in like a fast food spots, like you're like a loser. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like the 16 year old is like, I don't want to be. I want to be that dude, you know what I mean? But they kind of got to work together to accomplish this accomplish this goal. Exactly. I think two things that I really focused on um, in that in that kind of situation is one, treating every team member with respect and showing them um, that their role matters, their skill set matters, and their expertise matters. And then also, I think what we do in the in the food service industry that needs a lot of improvement is showing people that there's opportunity beyond just your current role. You know, at Chick-fil-A, especially, you know, at my restaurant, you can learn finance, you can learn operations, you can learn customer service, you can learn HR, you can learn marketing, uh, community outreach and so forth, uh, how to analyze P&Ls, how to budget, how to forecast. You can do all of that while ne never leaving our restaurant. You know, you can enter the Chick-fil-A leadership development program if you choose to apply to get, you know, lifelong skills in management and, and business development and so forth. So I market every job that I market, I market as there's an opportunity for additional advancement and training so that you can see more than just the current role that you're in, even if it's just an entry level um, team member role. There is a blueprint and there is a future that you can have here at our restaurant. and Promoting that along with treating everybody with respect, regardless of the position and caring about them more than just what they can do for the business has been really beneficial to us. And we have been able to retain a large amount of our staff, I think, in part because of that. Yeah, no, that's that's dope. Um, I, re I remember applying to be a, uh, a franchise owner for a, another restaurant chain and they were like telling me. If you don't want to be in this rest in the in the in the restaurant, you know, ten hours a day, they was like, don't even uh, don't even apply, right. and uh, they were saying they were just naming some of the challenges of of staffing, mm -hmm. and one of those being like working with those teens, you know, because some of the the teenagers that are are really great workers, a lot of time they're involved in a million things at school, so they can't have a consistent schedule. And then you're saying that around prom time, everybody calling off. I guess you haven't hit, really hit prom yet because of of, uh, of 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 COVID, right? But um, yeah, I have a whole new respect for um, restaurant owners. I mean, I always respected entrepreneurs because I've been in business about nine years now. But uh, yeah. but managing 110 uh, people, how how many? About like what percentage of that is full time and and, and part time? Yeah, yeah, full time. We probably have about. 35%. So 65% obviously is, is part-time and, you know, <clears throat> it's a, it's a daunting task, as you mentioned, but mm -hmm. fortunately for me, I have a strong, strong leadership team, uh, which I think you have to have to be able to not just manage that people aspect, but you know, that, that Chick-fil-A supply chain is intense and the so operations um, that go on behind the scene to, to, to deliver that service and deliver that quality and deliver that timeliness is extensive. So um, as much as we've invested in our team members, I've taken a lot of time to carefully invest in our leadership as well to make sure that they have all the resources they need to not only you know, care for our team members, but to also perform their jobs at a high level because uh, operationally, uh, there's a lot of moving parts from you know the ordering systems to the storing to food prep to uh, the time it takes to deliver the food to the time it takes to bag the food and the time it takes to ultimately get the food to the guest um, is a sophisticated supply chain and without that strong leadership um, you know you won't be able to, to reach your potential and one glitch in the matrix can throw everything off so Right. Very important to also invest in leadership along with that team member. How long How long was your training process to become an owner? Yeah, um, you train for a couple months um, in, you know, top to bottom aspects of the of the business and um, then come out and get some hands on experience. So, oh, OK, so you do have you do have to shadow some uh, some other folks. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, for me, you can always, you know, reach out to, you know, operators or so forth. 
um, you know, at various levels of your application process. And I was fortunate to get experience um, in a couple of stores in California and out here in New Jersey. So um, that definitely helped out as well. What um, so is there is there any do you know how to do every role in the restaurant? <laughs> Yeah, I do. I do have a working knowledge of, of every role. Uh, <laughs> definitely not the best at it. You know, I'm smart enough to know I need to, to hire uh, people who are more proficient than me at some of those roles. But yeah, I do have a working uh, understanding of every role. That's good. And yeah. so, um, I mean, is there situations like where you have, you have to tell your team like, yo, that's not <clears throat> that's not my responsibility. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's what I pay you for. Or Or are you like, involved in every single aspect yeah no i'm i'm hands-on i'm hands -on. oh really really yeah i think that's tough man that's tough yeah. to be hands-on like that yeah. it, it's absolutely hands-on and i think one leading by example you know being able to do every role and doing it at certain times really connects me with my team uh my rank and file for the most part uh it shows that i'm in it with them and that i'm just not you know uh a distant, you know, owner or what have you. Um, and it gets me a lot of credibility and they appreciate seeing me in the trenches with them when necessary. So yeah, we are we're, we're hands on, man. How, uh, how, how long you think you can be away from the restaurant and it, it, it run itself? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I do imagine going on vacation at some time, but, uh, I just, I haven't had the time to just yet, but, um, you know, as long as we continue to grow and develop that leadership and that management team and scale the business, I'm sure uh, at some point I'll be able to get a little bit of R&R &R in, in a restaurant still functioning properly. So when, when you first found out uh, that you were awarded the opportunity, uh, what walk me through that day? Yeah, uh, it's I I'll always remember it. Uh, my wife and I, we flew into Atlanta and had our final interview and um you know talked about the location and so forth and but she was crunching it, them numbers before like baby look <laughs> baby <laughs> if we get this <laughs> yeah we definitely uh we definitely did some financial modeling and and seeing how things would kind of work out you know in different types of scenarios and so forth but um you know like i mentioned before it's it's up to us to really execute and be yeah. able to you know achieve you know, different levels of success, you know, it's on the operator. So what well, we did look at that and, you know, thought it was a great opportunity. It's always um, a motivator. You know? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> a big part of it, you know, um, being able to, to secure your future and build that legacy. That's what we all dream about, you know, mm -hmm. especially in our community, man, you know, oh, yeah, for have sure. a lot of that infrastructure in place, uh, being able to to do that and set up the next generation and just build that generational wealth is always a, a goal. So we, we we got there and interviewed and um, got that last kind of you know touch point and talked about the location, talked about the work that would be required, and talked about the commitment from you know all levels of the family and so forth. And uh, we got our um, our acceptance, and I mean we celebrated in the airport you know we were living out in san francisco then so we celebrated in the airport and celebrated for about two weeks later and uh started to tell all of our friends and um and family that it's officially done and uh we had sufficiently climbed that first mountain which was getting uh the franchise and then we were just gearing up for that second and most important step which is running it mm -hmm. yeah. what um what about uh your, your, your close family and friends, what, what, what were their reaction? Yeah, I mean, everybody was super uh, supportive. Everybody was happy and proud of us um, because we had shared, you know, the journey that we've been on. And um, they knew, you know, some of the work that we had put in and the commitment that we had made uh, to pursue the opportunity. So they were very, very supportive and couldn't wait. Um, I had uh, a lot of people really come out to our grand opening and celebrate with us. So it was phenomenal, man. And then also the the reach out from the Howard community, you know, the networks and friends there were super supportive. So it couldn't have been a, a better rollout and we couldn't have had, you know, better support from family and friends and networks. You you have any like new cousins and new family members <laughs> to pop up? <laughs> new people popping up, yeah, you know. Uh, 
I, I haven't had that, but I do have, uh, you know, some people who, you know, really are, uh, I have been new friends and, you know, new networks and so forth that I've been able to, to, uh, to network with and so forth. So, um, that's been really good, man. Really, really good. What about, um, I mean, do people be like coming through expecting a hookup? Like, yo, man, <laughs> Will, what's up? Making me an extra nugget, bro. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Fortunately, no, nah, everybody has been, been real cool about that. You know, they get that it's the it's, it's a business and so forth. Um, I think I did have a couple people come out from Howard and, you know, just because they came out to support early on. The whole frat, the, the frat came <laughs> through like, <laughs> found his day. Will, Will could hook it up. Right, you know, like. Go get your own and go get your own. Let me talk for a little bit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but now everybody has been real supportive and actually have, have uh, brought about some business to us, you know, talked about their workplace and catering and so forth and, you know, looked out for us in that end. So that was really, really, uh, you know, great to see. Man, so you were in Silicon Valley. What was, yeah, I mean, Silicon Valley, folks get paid out there, man. I mean, yeah. So for you to go from Silicon Valley to for this opportunity, it must financially it must be super rewarding. But what was it like working in uh and and living in the in the Bay Area? Yeah, yeah. Have you have you seen the the HBO show Silicon Valley? I you know I watched like a couple of the first <laughs> season, but it it started off kind of slow, so I didn't yeah. I, I didn't stick with it. I tell you, man, a lot of that is true. You well, know? yeah, BJ said that he was like, "Man, that's the most accurate uh, yeah. <laughs> p- portrayal of living out here that I've yep. ever seen." Yep, yep. And BJ, BJ was spot on. And actually, he and I, he lived out in Palo Alto, and I lived in Sunnyvale, and we were literally about fifteen minutes away. Well, California traffic, you know, probably about 20, 25 minutes. But yeah, it was it was very much like that. You know, um, seeing people who were really, really smart and really, really driven. Maybe not with a ton of personality, but a lot of focus and a lot of uh, legacy of doing well and uh, achieving, especially in math and computer science and engineering and so forth. So it was it, it was a t- intense. It was a it was different, you know, environment. Uh, it's very diverse, obviously, but it's it's so tech focused and tech centered um, that it was a little different than um, than what I was used to, but. I ingratiated myself as soon as I got in. I dove into tech, especially in robotics and automation, uh, focused on how we could help uh, different industries and high tech clients to reduce bottlenecks, improve efficiencies through robotics, and then you know take that workforce and retrain them to more value added tasks. And it was really, really rewarding. You know, I loved it working with. I mean, I was working with great clients like Cisco and. Uh, Apple and uh, LinkedIn and so forth. So I got a chance to really expand my tech knowledge and also appreciate entrepreneurship and uh, what it takes to uh, to be a successful entrepreneur in the Valley. And it was also a little weird because I tell you, man, when I first got there, we first moved in, it didn't rain for like seven months, bro. Oh, really? <laughs> like every day is the same, man. You're like 75 and sunny from June until like almost the end of the year. And then we started to get some rain in December. So uh, the culture was a little different. The industry was a little different. The weather was a little different. Uh, but overall, it was a great experience. And without it, I don't think that I would have uh, met some of the people that I, I did. Um you know, be able to have that kind of experience and work for a great company like IBM um, in the process. So the Valley was a great, great experience. Wow. Wow. That's, yeah. that's, that's awesome, man. I know it's, um, how was the adjustment to living in the Valley? Because, uh, you know, you, you come from, you from DC, right? DC. So yeah. You from that's chocolate city. That's right. That's you know, right. You go to Howard, yeah. you go to the, the Bay. It ain't really that much <laughs> chocolate, you know, <laughs> Yeah, it was the craziest thing, man, because that's what we notice is that, you know, living on a peninsula and that's that's really, um, you know, Silicon Valley it stretches from, you know, some people would say like, um, you know, in Burlingame, the San Jose, you know, is really that valley. Um, and there's not a lot of, um, you know, black people who live in those in, in on the peninsula. And we found it very challenging to get that flavor other than going to Oakland which was 
about an hour north northeast of us mm -hmm. or in the, in the east bay uh which was also like 45 minutes to an hour so not having that daily interaction with you know a lot of um african americans was different and we missed that you know like we would have to set up dates you know with the with the people that we did have in our networks to on a calendar a month month and a half in advance because everybody was working and dealing with kids wow um, to meet up and hang out and get that get that experience because you wouldn't see it on a daily basis out there in your in your daily life so that was a little different man 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 so so you're at work you know you're doing your thing in a in your career yeah and you and you and you still felt that there was more out there or maybe something was missing because you could have very well stayed out there and yeah. financially been on yeah. the same path yeah. what was missing in silicon valley that you now have with yeah. as a restaurateur yep now, that's a great question and it goes back to that desire to want entrepreneurship you know, and that conversation that I had back at Howard, you know, about what I wanted out of my life ultimately and sticking to that trajectory. You know, I'm a big believer in planning your work and working your plan. So um, I, I, I could have had a Chick-fil-A, you know, I could have pursued Chick-fil-A out in California. You know, it's a growing area as well, mm -hmm. but um, wanting to kind of get out of Silicon Valley in the tech scene, and wanting to come back home to the East Coast, you know, was really, really big for me. Um, but without going out West, I wouldn't have been able to um, really appreciate coming back East and what it had to offer as far as family and, and entrepreneurship. So, but yeah, IBM was great and being out there was great, but it wasn't entrepreneurship. It wasn't my own business. It wasn't me doing my own thing, uh, signing the check from William to William, you know? And mm. that's what I ultimately wanted. And I wasn't going to stop until I found the opportunity that was right for me. So no matter how great it was, cashing, you know, checks from IBM and working from them, it wasn't my own thing. And I had decided. So that was that was important. Yeah. And uh, you had the full and it was no pushback from the wife at all. Cause that's a big sacrifice for her, too. Yeah. I mean, and that's the great thing about, you know, uh, my wife, like when we started early on, um we we mapped out what we wanted and she was you know her being a, a businesswoman herself and working her way you know through corporate retail and uh loving what she does she always was supportive of me uh pursuing entrepreneurship when that time was right and like i said she helped in every step of the way and um she was she was for it man she was for it hey, talk about the importance of having a supportive spouse when yeah, you um it's invaluable it's invaluable um, having her, you know, bounce ideas off of to talk about how we can build generational wealth to not have to, you know, worry about, you know, negative aspects of, you know, things that people might go through uh, in relationships to be able to to plan out our future and to be able to um, know what it takes to execute that. and and hold it down in those tough times, you know, like that's huge. I mean, it was times in, during COVID where, you know, I was out building a business, networking, trying to hire, what have you. And she would be on Zoom calls all day for work while also, um, you know, getting our son his his lessons through Zoom and so forth um, and, and holding it down. So she has been just phenomenal, man. Like. I couldn't ask for a better wife, a better partner, and she, she yeah. Howard or no? No, no, she went to UPenn. She oh, okay. UPenn, so. Oh, so you, so you married up, huh? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> man. Like, I tell you, man, it's funny. We were next door neighbors when we met. Oh, wow, that's it's crazy. A, it's a funny story, man. And um, talk about all or nothing, but <laughs> we hit it off, and um, we definitely. She, she's definitely. Uh, just just a rock you know super smart she's a warden girl and um you know knows business and knows how to really support and, and hold me down so she's were you uh were you at howard with mr you was at howard with mr gray right yeah mr yeah. gray Earl yeah. gray man rest his soul man yeah man what a what a big influence he was on everybody that Absolutely. came through the school of b at that time yep. mr gray 
uh, was, was really, really influential. Miss Hampton, of course, Dr. Harvey and professors and so forth, man. It was, and Mr. Gray, his, his inspiration, he always, he never had a bad day, man. He always had a great disposition. He always had some words of encouragement. He always, um, you know, kept me focused on, you know, ultimately what I wanted to achieve out in Howard. But mm -hmm. he also, I remember having some conversations with him um, and, form, and it kept me to have in perspective, you know, like enjoy the whole college experience, not just the academics, of course, but the social scene, uh, the fraternity scene and so forth. So I'll, I'll always remember Mr. Gray. Welcome to the Go Fish Village podcast. As a Chinese proverb says, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. At Go Fish, our goal is to teach individuals just like you how to build wealth through real estate. But now being from D.C., what 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 made you decide to, to go to Howard? Yeah, yeah. Now, my mom, she uh, she worked at Howard University Hospital, so I had an opportunity to attend school uh remission of tuition so <laughs> uh that was oh, that was wow. one of the plans yeah that we looked at early on um and i grew up around howard you okay. know I come to the campus all the time my cousins and with my mom so i always knew i was going to howard there oh nice nice yeah. well that's that's pretty simple man so yeah. so did, did howard live up to the expectation it did. It did. You know, I got so much from there. Um, you know, the people were awesome. Um, being able to really develop that hustle, man, you know, because Howard has has that way of of, of getting people to pursue entrepreneurship, whether it be cutting hairs and, and Drew yeah. or, you know, um, you know, moving other classmates in and out of dorms and so forth, you know, tutoring and and, you know, helping other people out, you know, in other classes and stuff like that. So it developed that drive. It developed that desire to, to, to want more. And, you know, the people seeing the academics and then also being a part of um, Beta Chapter was phenomenal. Um, and it really laid out the, the foundation for me uh, to build on and, and, and do more. What, what makes Beta Chapter different from uh, just a different experience? Yeah, I would say really the history, man, you know, like we are essentially um, with, the, with the second chapter founded. Uh, BJ, out. BJ, like, well, we really, the, we really, the, we really the second chapter, but we really the, the first chapter. Yep, I was just going to say, we really, <laughs> really are Alpha chapter because the Cornell Alpha chapter is no longer. Oh, man, no chapter. shade, right? No shade. Yeah, right, right, right. All due respect, <laughs> you know, but uh, it's just in the caliber of people, too, you know, like I could pick up the phone and talk to brothers who have financial backgrounds, who, you know, I got frat brothers who are stockbrokers, uh, frat brothers who day trade, who are doctors, who are dentists, who are other entrepreneurs. So any type of call or any type of need or desire I have, I can pick up the phone, man. And it's just a tight knit brotherhood that is really, you know, there to support each other, support, um, you know, the community and really make, um, you know, better black men. And um, pledging Alpha in spring of 2001 with my LBs and my staff and my big brothers. I mean, it was the best situation um, that I could have possibly done at Howard. And I loved every minute of it, man, and still do. Did, did you realize at the time the history? Or, I mean, I know that they tell you you read your history, but when you're 17 or 19, you're not, you just reading to kind of yeah. memorize yeah. it. But did you have a perspective at that time of what you were getting yourself into? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, we did because you know when we when we would um, when we would go through um, <laughs> different uh, different learning situations and different uh, <laughs> <laughs> opportunities for development. Yeah, you know, like you could uh, you could get a, a feel for the caliber of brothers who um, who you would talk to, and you know, <laughs> do you know who this is? <laughs> <laughs> And if you don't know, you better find out real fast. Uh, but uh, yeah, just hearing their trajectory, seeing the things that they did on on Howard's campus and the roadmap that they've taken throughout their life is uh, is really, really impressive. And, you know, like I said, I got we have brothers that are every single walk of life that um, you can tap into and connect with and, and really uh, vibe with, man. So it's it's phenomenal. And, you know, going through 
you know, uh, like probate and so forth. I remember those days. Like I'm like, this is history in the making, man. Like we're 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 the only, you know, uh, members of Beta Chapter in 2001. Just the 13 of us, and that's history in the making. So, really, what, what was what was probate like? What was probate. that day like? Man, it was it was you running off adrenaline, Josh. You running off adrenaline, like. From the first moment you line up and then you see everybody out in the yard and you know you see the other frats and sororities um you know out there supporting shout out to you know the aka's our, our sisters and obviously bst and sg rose and his ages as well so um just that that intensity that energy you're just running off of fumes man you know you're running off that adrenaline in my position i was in the middle of the line i was seven out of 13 so i was the breath man which really was you know, the person who sets everything off. And, you know, I had to remember all of the greetings, all of the steps. Oh, and wow. So you was a smart guy. Everybody. You was yeah. a shiner. <laughs> you was a shiner. Hey, it's, it's seven founders, too. So you probably had a little bit rough. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, but, you know, I mean, we just went off adrenaline. And um, it, it was a great experience, man. Being able to, to have all of that work culminate and coming out on the yard was fantastic, man. So when... And I remember, man, and, and seeing you in passing in, in college, yeah. you always came off as like like a grown man. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, were you like, how focused were you at, at Howard? Yeah, man. I was focused like a laser, man. Like I was, it was always, you know, where am I right now and how can I get to that next step? And that's a that's a double edged sword, Josh. You know, like uh, I sacrificed, you know, a lot while at Howard to to build that foundation and to build that. Because I, I thought you was a teacher when I met when, when we was twenty. I was like, who's this man? <laughs> who's a grown man, man? Keep coming around us. <laughs> you was you was you was always uh, you was a serious guy, man. So, yeah. and I, I had Chris Tyson on here as as well, and yeah. um, he kind of talked about like some regrets that he had from being too focused but then he also talked about how that worked in his benefit you know can you kind of speak to that yeah no absolutely and that's what i was i was talking about as far as that double-edged sword i mean um there were you know some trade-offs that i i had to make you know back in those days and but that seriousness you know laid out that foundation it allowed me to have that conversation with you know my ldp advisor at howard and um, kind of plan out that work and it helped me to get to where I am right now. But yeah, I did sacrifice, you know, um, you know, I could have had a more extensive network other than, you know, a close knit of friends and, you know, the, the fraternity would have you. And, uh, even as an adult, you know, could have had a couple more vacations thrown in there, but, um, it's been, you know, a lot of heads down, you know, working hard, but now, um, I have that perspective. I've reached uh, a, a great goal right now, and um, I'm gonna start tapping into some of those things that um, that I kind of put off to the side um, for that grind, man. But um, it's coming. It's coming. Yeah, we we at that age where you know yeah. you you in the 40s or just about to hit 40 or lower 40s, where you thinking about well, you know you like that, like okay, I'm thinking about retirement. You know, right. I'm making money, but I want to, you know, but you also have like levels of anxiety. You know, it's kind of like where you, you know, you you work hard to get to this point you always want to be at. And then now the stress becomes how do you maintain this level yeah. that you've gotten to? So what are things that you do <clears throat> for a balance right yeah. now? Yeah. Um, really just focusing on the family. You know, my son, the dude is is awesome, man. He's so dynamic and he's so well versed in school. Um, spending more time now with my wife and, and family and really starting to to give back, you know, uh into some philanthropic efforts um is another thing that I'm tapping into uh local churches and local um communities and so forth. So me being able to, you know, give back in both time and treasure is something that I'm focused on now. Um, and then just really spending more time with family and, and vacationing, man, you know, we getting ready to, to, uh, do a little bit more of that, you know, now that the business is somewhat scaled and, uh, doing really well, 
So now I can turn my attention more towards those qualitative things that I've been putting in all the work for to, to experience. And, you know, that's what I'm really looking forward to. Awesome, man. Awesome. Right. Yeah. No, I know that's a, I know that's a grind, man. So are we going to be looking at two, three, four stores in the future? Or man, what? if I can get, um, if I can get, you know, in a position to do that, that would be fantastic. It's definitely a goal to expand. Um, but you know, just focusing on this one now and doing as, as, as good of a job as I can for our young people, um, is really, really the biggest, um, uh, thing that I have right now, uh, going. So yeah, man. Yeah. Okay. So at, at Howard, what, what was your major at Howard? I was business, business and marketing. Okay. Uh, me too. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Biz, business marketing and, uh, straight out of Howard. I mean, you, you got your MBA from Rutgers, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Actually, uh, Rutgers actually, it was, a, I had a nice little gap in experience because right from, from Howard, I went to, uh, Conical Phillips and then Exxon Mobil, and then a Russian oil company, Luke Oil, and um, and forecasting operations, um, and so forth. And then kind of hit that proverbial glass ceiling, man. And then wanted to go to B school, um, and wanted to get into tech. So Rutgers was phenomenal, and um, really provided a lot of great opportunities for me in the business school. And then um, I was fortunate enough to get. Um, opportunities with Intel, Microsoft, IBM, and Johnson and Johnson, and um, finally selected IBM and moved out west, bro. How much? Um, I mean, did do you do you feel like Howard adequately prepared you for your career? Yep. In tech and sales, and even at Rutgers, yeah. do you feel yeah. like you were equipped for that? Yeah. No, Howard. Howard laid that foundation. You know, like I said, um, and it really. You know, I think having the professors that I had really broke down the material and applied it to real life, you know, situations, those case studies. I mean, you remember them, man, those case studies, yeah. uh, being able to, you know, really absorb the information in a high way and then being able to go on internships and apply those um, those learnings. You know, I was fortunate to have internships at Howard as well. So um, it really, really um prepare me and then also having that nurturing, you know, kind of a relationship with some of the professors and administrators and so forth really, really helped me, man. And um, I got a lot of great advice. Actually, um, three of the models that I really kind of live by were really formed by some of my relationships and mentors at Howard. So Wow, that's dope, yeah. man. Yeah. When, when you look back at everything you've accomplished, you and your wife, Mm -hmm. And now you you've been blessed to have a son. Yeah. What what is what what do you what do you think about? Yeah, I think about right now um, on the family side, just continuing to to provide for them. You know, be that not just financially, but you know, emotionally as well. And legacy. I mean, legacy, legacy. I, I always play. You know that Jay Z song. You know, what's yeah, the sure. will and all that kind of stuff. And. Um, want to leave a, a solid legacy for my son and, and family and uh, really instill in him, even at a, a young age, you know, the importance of planning, education, money, how to, to manage it and how to, you know, earn it. And, you know, really just set up generation two and three to, to really be successful, man. That's the biggest thing. <clears throat> what are, what, what's some things, uh, <clears throat> And uh, the legacy piece is dope. I mean, yeah. you, you definitely start to think about that a lot once you have yep. children, man. Yeah. Um, in terms of like you, you, you name some stuff like creating wealth. Yeah. Um, what are some things that you know people watching this like when like me as an entrepreneur? Yeah. You know, I'm like, man. You know, uh, I would have loved at an earlier age to have been exposed to blank or you know like what are some things that you think academia should expose us to or you as a, a head of household as a, as a father right what are some things that you think that every parent should pour into their child yeah not great 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 question i think as far as academia um i think that they can really teach people obviously we have entrepreneur courses and so forth but 
I think that they could teach more about how to plan out your future. You know, like one thing that my mentor always told me was, you know, um, if you want to see what your future looks like, then start creating it now. Mm. You know, uh, being able to teach young uh, college students how to plan properly, map out their career, um, not just go for the quick buck, but to strategically move through um, their career, make great choices in the businesses that they might uh, want to pursue, and the importance of, you know, obviously, um, you know, managing your money, you know, wisely, your, your 401k account, uh, having your emergency fund, being able to uh, understand, you know, investments and so to speak, and uh, learning really how to, um, to make money. You know, um, my accountant, his motto is, you know, uh, spend less, make more and invest a difference. And to be able to understand those concepts and apply them to a uh, student's life versus just teach them how to get a job, I think is, is really, really important. And I think another, another big thing is a lot, of, a lot of us as college students, you know, and sometimes we need to because we have student loan debt, we got people we got to repay and all that kind of stuff. But if you have the opportunity, I think schools should also teach people to, you know, chase great leadership and not money. You know, if you're able to work for and partner with great leaders, uh, then, you know, more than likely you'll have the opportunity to learn how to lead and the money will come. You know, every step of my career, I've been fortunate to chase leadership, whether it be in that second level or senior leadership in Exxon and ConocoPhillips, and especially in IBM, I always chased leadership and wanted to put myself in the best position um, to work for a great company until I went off on my own and I never chased money, but following that great leadership money will, will surely come. So those are two things that I think, um, academia can do better, you know, for young college students, as far as team, you know, as far as, um, I'm sorry, family teaching our, our kids and so forth, you know, um, I think in our communities, you know, oftentimes we got to learn how to swim with no lifeguard. Man. We don't have uh, a lot of the infrastructure in place that really puts a premium on education and uh, financial literacy and being able to, um, you know, manage your funds and, you know, understand compound interests and investments and how the financial world works. I think uh, in some sectors in some areas we do a great job in you know our community is strong in a lot of ways but i think parents if parents can talk about that that um that financial awareness that um that desire and necessity to work and apply uh yourself at an early age whether it be through you know right now i have my son taking orders from chick-fil-a you know like he and i are going through the motions of how to take an order he knows about, you know, the, the different, you know, rules about money. You, know, you can buy it, sell it, hold it, but you don't want to hold it because of inflation and so forth. You know, like he's four years old and I'm already embedding those concepts into him, you know, um, and really learning how to put off um, something for today for your future. You know, I think that those things are, are, are some things that we can really uh, in bed in our, in our, in our youngsters. Nice, man. So, so what's next for you, Will? Yeah. Um, I think really just continuing on with, uh, with Chick-fil-A, obviously it's been a fantastic partnership and, um, I love the, the culture. I love the business. I love the people, you know, um, right now I have the opportunity to hire about, you know, 65% of my workforce, 70% of my workforce actually are young, you know, African-American and Latinos. So, I'm able to give back to the community uh, in that regard. I'm able to, you know, develop some of these young team members and hopefully into, you know, some good productive members of society. So just really continuing to dive in on that, um, the family aspect, being a great husband, being a great father, and just trying to, you know, keep moving it forward, man, while appreciating where I am, um, continuing that drive, man. Like, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm wired to, you know, continue to, to keep pressing man, and keep doing well, you know? What, um, if, you know, if somebody wants to, to 
support your location? I mean, how where, where are you located at? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Uh, we're located at 4801 Stelton Road in South Plainfield um, in Middlesex Mall uh, in Middlesex County, New Jersey. And uh, love to, to, uh, to see you guys come out and uh, ask for me. And from there, I'll definitely chop it up a little bit. Uh, we had a tremendous amount of support from uh, Howard students in that area and uh, really appreciate it and um, look forward to to uh, to serving every community, especially my Howard community, man. Yeah. So what what's at the end of the day? What do you want your legacy to be? Yeah. Um, somebody who, who put people first, who um, who was thought of as a great leader, a great family man, but also somebody who who gave back and really took advantage of, um, you know, philanthropic efforts, you know, like I continue to contribute to Howard, continue to contribute to, you know, other local charities or what have you to kind of build up that next gen, you know, like, you know, I'm good. My, my family is good, you know, for, you know, hopefully a couple of generations, but it's not about me. It's about we, you know, so I, I have to do more and continue to do more for not just myself, but for other, you know, young black kids too. William Bridges, man, you've been a great guest. Thanks for thanks for coming on and taking time out on the show, bro. Yes, sir, Josh. Appreciate you, man. And uh, thanks for having me. You're doing a great, you know, service as far as getting out some stories to the Howard uh, community, man. Um, you're a great brother. And um, thank you for your efforts and much continued success to you too, man. You got great things going on as well, brother. Thanks. Appreciate that, man. Thank you for joining the HU Movemaker podcast, where we highlight folks that have contributed to the Howard legacy at the highest levels. To hear more interviews or purchase merchandise, please visit www.humovemakers.com.